Okay. Well, it is good to see you guys, and I want to give you guys kudos for being here, and kudos for you guys who are signing up on Facebook and the interaction. And it raises a question that I've been asking is, well, why, why do we show up? I mean, why, why, why do we go through the trouble of showing up here on Sundays, and why do you go through the trouble of, you know, signing up on Facebook Live? Because, you know, there's other things we could be doing. And, uh, and, and here's, the, here's the deal. The last eight months has uh, um, really made it difficult for us to get motivated to show up. It's like, why do it? It's kind of taking the wind out of our sails. And so it's, it's a struggle we're facing with. And, and then some of you even go the extra mile and show up for a, a Zoom Bible class. And uh, now, honestly, it, going to church has never been easier. You know, back in the day, going to church was a much bigger deal than we have to go through. But even still, I sincerely ask, what, why do we show up? What motivates us? Because uh, it's, it, it's an issue we're facing. One of the big, big challenges we've been facing this last eight months is people aren't motivated to come to church. Not even motivated to sign up on Zoom or Facebook Live. People are having, easy, it's an easier thing to find something else to do. We are just unmotivated. We are, in fact, facing a bigger pandemic than the COVID. And that pandemic is spiritual apathy. Man, people are just, it's, it's like I say, the wind is out of our sails. We don't care. And so we have been seeing a decline in people's interaction, engagement with the church. And I'm sure some of you have felt the pull too. And so again, I'm, I'm thanking you. These kinds of sermons are always a struggle for me because it's like I'm preaching to the choir. You know, it's like the people need to hear this, the people who aren't here. So pass the message, and of course we'll post this. But, uh, you know, people are experiencing that widespread apathy about engaging with the fellowship. Now, I know some churches and some preachers respond to this by trying to make church more exciting and more appealing and more attractional. And I'm not against being appealing and attractional and all that kind of stuff. I, I think we should all bathe regularly and brush our teeth and, you know, teeth and, and not drive people away. And, and, and that opportunities video, that's, I mean, that's just a hoot. I just love that stuff. And, and so, but we got to be sure to remember as a church, the main attraction here is Jesus. Amen? Yeah. He's the one we want to point people to. He's the reason we come here. And he's the reason, you know, we want you guys to connect with us online or here. It has to be about him. And if you don't have any motivation to connect with him, to grow in him, then we got nothing for you. We really don't. We, there's not much more we can do. We're not going to dress it up. And if you're not interested in Jesus, we're not going to try to make him more appealing. Right? I love the buddy Jesus picture. Where is it? There we go. And some people even try to dress Jesus up, make him interesting. We're not going to do that. Jesus is worth, you know, seeking out all by himself. And really, this message is not a call to get back to church. It's really a call to get back to Jesus. And uh, that's why in our series, we've been looking at the first chapters of Paul's letters. And today we're in, in the letter to the Colossians. And I want you to pay attention to what Paul says at the very end of that chapter in verses 28 and 29. And this is what Paul says. It says, we proclaim him, Jesus, okay, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. And Paul says, to this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works within me. That's what Paul is all about, proclaiming Jesus, wanting people to grow up in Jesus. Now let me put your minds at ease right away and explain what it means to be perfect in Christ. Because I don't know about you, but that sounds a little daunting. I mean, perfect in Christ, I, that's, that's not going to happen in this lifetime. Well, understand that that word perfect in this context more accurately or appropriately means mature. And so it's about being mature in Christ. We want to present everybody in mature, mature in Christ. It's a growing up thing. We want everybody to grow up in Jesus. And uh, that's what we struggle and labor for. With God's power, not our own. And that's what God wants to see. That's what we want to see in our lives. And so that's what my hope is for those of you who show up here. And for those of you who show up online. That's why we show up. Hopefully you have a desire to connect with, to grow up, to be in Jesus. And that's why we're here 
But it raises another question, what does that exactly mean? What does it mean to be mature in Christ? Well, as we read through Colossians, Paul gives us a number of benchmarks that we can look at and say, oh, that's what it means. You know, if I, I'm mature in Christ when I do these things. So the first one I came up with is in verses 9 and 10 of Colossians 1. If I'm to become a mature, Christ, mature in Christ, I need to learn, my, get, learn to get the ability to understand God's will and do God's will. And uh, Paul says in verses 9 and 10, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And you see, as we grow up in Christ, we gain spiritual wisdom and understanding to know God's will. We, we learn to know it. When we start out, we're never quite sure. But as you grow, we become more in tune with God, and we know what pleases him. We know what his will is. And... Uh, and then we become more capable of applying it to our lives. And understand, it's not just about knowing God's will. It's about doing God's will and bearing fruit. Paul goes on to say in verse 10, We pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord, to please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. So, as I become a mature, a mature Christian, I learn God's will. I learn to do his God's will. And in doing so, I bear fruit. And I experience God and reflect Christ more. And hopefully, you want that. And I got to tell you, that doesn't happen unless we show up. There is something that happens in the fellowship that enables us to do this. If we are just by ourselves at home, this will not happen. I cannot become mature in Christ by myself or just with my family at home. We need each other. There's something about this that makes that happen. If I become mature in Christ... I also need to progressively let Jesus be in charge of every aspect of my life. And we learn this in verses 17 and 18 of chapter 1. He, said, he says, Jesus is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. As I mature in Christ, I learn to let Jesus have the supremacy in every aspect of my life. Now, I don't know about you, but, you know, when I first became a Christian, I gave him my life in general. But it took years to learn how to make Jesus Lord of my life in the specifics. How many of you have heard the saying, the devil's in the details? Right? Well, so is Jesus. God is in the details. He doesn't want us to be Christians in, in the general sense. He wants sovereignty, control. He wants to be the boss of me in the details of my life. And so when I accept Christ, I give my life in general, but it takes a while and I realize, wait a minute, he's really not Lord of my finances. Okay, Jesus, I guess I need to take that step and let you be controlled of my finances. And, I, and then I discover he's not Lord of my marriage. That I'm not, you know, my marriage is suffering because he's not Lord of my marriage. So I bring him into that. And my job. And there, I find all these areas of my life where I've not made him Lord of my life. And, uh, and my mouth. Lord of my mouth and the things that come out of it. And as I grow, I learn to bring my anger issues and my fear issues and my shame issues, every issue, every thought, under the obedience of Jesus Christ. And so that's maturity. But guess what? I was never able to do that apart from the fellowship. I mean, I read my Bible and do stuff on my own. But I got to tell you, when I came here and heard messages and heard worship God and heard prayer requests, and it, it's transforming. We're challenged to grow. We need this to grow. And uh, if I'm to become a mature Christian, I need to grow in my ability to distinguish Christ's voice from all the other voices speaking to us out in the world. Uh, we've been consistently reminding you throughout this series of all the other false voices that are speaking to us in the world and, and, and to hone in on the voice of Jesus, to hear the voice of Jesus. Now, Many of these voices are ideological voices. They're, they're, it's the philosophy. They're rooted in the philosophy of man, human traditions. And we've been seeing ideology at war in our society. And you have to understand, it's human ideology sometimes, but it's, it's not grounded in God's truth. And you see, we need to listen to Jesus to be rooted and grounded in him and not human thinking. And so... That's why Paul says in verses 6 and 8 of chapter 2 now, 
Just then as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than Christ. See, that's what we're talking about. And that's what it means to become a tour. We're rooted and grounded in Christ, and we learn to distinguish the voices. We, we, when the media comes on and tells us this or tells us that, we go, yeah, it's just that other voice, but I know the true voice. And it's not just ideologic voices. There are actually people who are very gifted, who are very persuasive, who are very interesting, entertaining, but they're not connected to the head. Paul goes on in chapter 2, verses 18 and 19, to say this, Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen. And his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. He's lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. You see, there's leaders out there with ultra-charismatic personalities. Oh, he sounds interesting. She sounds interesting. There's leaders out there who see visions and have revelations. Oh, wow, I want to hear about that. That sounds pretty good. And there's preachers and teachers out there who are preaching the latest self-help fads and amassing large followers. And we go, man, that sounds good. I, I want to be like that. And we listen to this stuff. And there are, that's more of the other voices that we need to learn to distinguish from Jesus. And we just have to be aware of that. And, uh, but I guess what? It doesn't happen. When I sit home by myself or with my family, and instead of connecting with the church body or hearing teaching or going to a study, oh, I got this home project I need to do. Or, you know, I want to watch another Christmas movie. And there's a bunch of them. I mean, yeah, it's like insane anymore. And uh, it's not even Thanksgiving yet. It's just, there's always, there's always something else to do. What motivates you to show up? Because this is where we become a true in Christ. And this is why we preach and teach with, you know, and admonish with all wisdom. This is why we exist. And our question is, are you interested in that? Are you interested in becoming mature in Christ? If I become a true in Christ, I need to learn to detach from the things that hold me hostage to this world and attach to the things above, to God, to the things that free me to the things that make me who God originally wants me to be. In Colossians chapter 3 now, verses 1 through 5. Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Now, this does not mean we go out to a desert and live like monks. Okay, that's not what he's suggesting. But what he's telling us is that in this lifetime, we are meant to transition in our lives from an earthly life to a heavenly life, from a physical life to a spiritual life. From a natural life to a supernatural life. That's, we're growing. And becoming mature in Christ means we don't live as just normal people. You know the book of Revelation, the most common reference to non-Christians in the book of Revelation? Earth dwellers. That's, it's called the earth dweller. That's the literal transition of the world of non-believers and non-Christians. Earth dwellers. We, don't, we aren't called to be earth dwellers. This is not our home. We have another home. And maturity means we, we make that transition. But I got to tell you, it doesn't happen without showing up. And Paul goes on to say, in order, in order for that to happen, we need to detach. We need to detach with God and allow Him to pull us to Him. And that means we need to let go and put to death the things that are connecting to this, to this world. And He actually gives us a list. You know, He talks about sexual immorality and impurity and lust and greed, which is about money. But the key word in that list is idolatry. It's all about idolatry. An idol is anything we depend on, trust in, sacrifice to, make a priority of, or worship other than Jesus. And most of us have a few idols tucked away in our lives still. You know, in the attic, 
in the basement, in a closet, in a drawer. I mean, they're hidden there. And I got to tell you, those idols don't become evident unless we come under the teaching of the body and hear it and be challenged to it. I very seldom am confronted with my idols sitting at home. Once in a while, I'll be reading the Bible and God will just, God will just hit me over the head with a two-by-four. But the real tough ones, we're in denial over. And we don't see it until we come to the church and hear someone's testimony. Someone shares, I was a slave to this or that or money and shame. And we hear that and we go, my gosh, that's me. That's me. And we find freedom because we're participating in the body of Christ. By the way, these idols or attachments, they especially show up in our emotional reactions, our negative emotional reactions. When you find yourself reacting with a great deal of anger or fear or shame or guilt or envy or jealousy, if you start feeling that and strong, I guarantee you there's an idol there somewhere. There's something we're attached to more than Jesus. There's something that God is calling us to let go of and give up to him. And that's what happens. When we are experiencing that turmoil, the proper thing a mature Christian does, we go to God and say, God, I'm experiencing this. It's bigger than me. So as an act of worship, I surrender it to you. Someone's Bible is reading. Is that you, Mike? Oh, Okay, we got to shut down. Maybe it's me. All right. Anyhow, we've, we've got to, you know, turn that over to God, and, and we never detach, we never crucify, we never put to death anything by our own power. It's always God. We bring Him into it, and uh, but I can tell you, that the freedom is there if we're willing to. But we need each other to make that happen. And finally, I be to become mature, I need to grow in my ability to bring Jesus into all the moments of my day. And I want you to go to chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. And Paul says this, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. That whole thing is all the time. Watchful means you're watching all day, not just at certain times. And it's like other passages which say we're to pray continually. It's a daily thing. We walk with God all day. And he goes on in verses 5 and 6 to say, Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. So it's not just here. It's our interaction with the people throughout our day. And he says, and make the most of every opportunity. Well, every opportunity is throughout our day. Let your conversations be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to respond and answer everyone. Where, when do those conversations happen? Throughout our day. It's an ongoing thing. And this, this passage describes a life where we keep Jesus with us, with us every moment of our day. This is what Brother Lawrence calls practicing the presence, or God's presence. This does not come naturally, okay? It comes through practice, comes through growth, prayer, thinking about God, and it comes through showing up. When I first became a Christian, you know, I was lucky if I thought about God between Sundays, have any of you done that? You, you come to church, oh, I'm thinking about God, and you walk out the door, it's like, he's gone. And you don't think about him again until the next Sunday. Now, there are some people who don't think about, think about God except for two days of the year, Easter and Christmas. So you got that. And you know, So I was lucky. But then I keep coming to church, and one day I hear a challenge. You know, you really need to be talking to God daily. So I started reading my Bible and having daily devotions. And that was a big improvement. So then I'd think, of, think about Jesus every morning, but I wouldn't think about him again until the next morning. So, you know, there's a whole 24 hours there. So, but it was an improvement. At least I've got him a little bit. And, you know, 46 years later, i got to confess, I still forget Jesus more than I would like to admit. But i got to tell you, I've learned to bring him in to more than just my mornings and my evenings and He's with me more throughout my day, especially when I'm experiencing fear or anger. And I got more peace in my life now than I've ever had. And, and, and so when I experience, again, the turmoil, I learn to bring him into my day. And man, what a peace we have. Mature Christians experience peace because we, let, we walk with Jesus throughout our day. And, uh, but it doesn't happen by itself. And I got to tell you, when I show up here, 
as a preacher or just attending when I hear Mike preach or Brad preach or one of the other elders preach, I am challenged. It keeps me on track. It keeps me from forgetting. It empowers me to continue to grow in Christ and become mature because when I don't show up, I become apathetic. I cease to care. I forget. And as I forget about God and more, I care less more and more, and pretty soon I'm living a pretty pathetic life. It's a sad existence, and my hope is that you won't fall into that. So show up. Because here's the deal. You, I, I can't do what I do until unless you guys come. Mike can't do what he does. We, we are called to preach and teach and challenge you. The worship is about challenging you and bringing you in connection with God. The singing I'm talking about. The offering meditations, the communion meditations, the, pray time, the prayer time, the praise reports, the kid message. Even the opportunities video serves a purpose to connect us in a positive way to God. And it doesn't happen without it. So we will continue. We will continue to proclaim him. Admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom. So that we may present all of you perfect, mature in Christ. And to this end we labor, struggling with all his energy which so powerfully works within us. But it does no good unless you guys continue to show up. Amen? All right, let's close. Stand. So I'll be standing for a closing word of prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for your patience with us. But Father, work in our hearts. Call us to a, call us afresh to uh, seek you, to connect with you. Fill us with that drive, that instinct um, to connect with you and your body so that we might become mature in you and experience all your fullness. And uh, we know that it's only through you that can happen. And so we just lift you up, we exalt you, and we ask that our church body grow in its maturity. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.